so hey, I'm James. I work at a company uh, called Pivotal. And I'm here to take uh, a few minutes today and share some of my experiences in building open source projects in the enterprise and just generally the different vectors of collaboration, uh, diffusion, uh, some more stories and uh, things I've seen. So it's not really a deep dive technically into the product I work on per se, uh, but it is a little bit of an overview of open source at Pivotal and my experiences in building open source communities and projects. So we're going to talk a little bit about what my colleague and the CTO of Spring Source, Adrian Collier, um, helped me with these slides, the four C's of open source, that we're always measuring ourselves and how we're doing across these four C's. We're going to talk about the different strategic models we've used to engage with a diverse set of communities. And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit more personally about what I like to think about as the most important thing in open source, which is the ability to get at an innate purpose motive. And that is someone who's doing something that's bigger than themselves, bigger than any one company they could work for. And there's just a genuine purpose that drives them and in participating intellectually there. And there's some great uh, talks done by Daniel Pink, who's a big inspiration to me, that talks about if you really want to get high quality intellectual work out of somebody, you have to give them a purpose motive. So I'm going to finish the talk talking a little bit about what, you know, what gets me up in the morning working on the project that I work on. So the interesting thing to me is that uh, this is in Denver. Um, which is where I started my career uh, in 1999. And so flying back for me here is a little bit of a retrospective. I started a company called Level 3 Communications out in Broomfield. I worked on Linux and Unix at the time. And uh, the experiences I had there was we were using a lot, like gobs and gobs of Sun Microsystems stuff with Solaris. Uh, and I was one of the first engineers that said, hey, this Linux thing is much faster cost per cost. It actually is really stable. There were all these things that people fudded it with back in the day. I'm like, no, I've had a box up for a year now. And uh, I ended up actually kind of knowing that the challenges would be there moving across the hill to Sun, which also had an office in uh, Broomfield. And eventually ended up working on a project called Open Solaris. And what happened was about 10 years too late in 2008, we finally shipped an open source edition of our software. And I think back as I'm working on this current project, and not to throw my ex-colleagues or the people I worked on this with under the bus, but what did we not get right with Open Solaris? It's something I was thinking about a lot today. And I think the idea that it was 10 years too late, so it should have happened in 1998. So I should have walked into level three and already had a competitor to Linux, which was Open Solaris, that I could use on any hardware. It was way too late. The other thing was that it was the business was in decline. That's part of the too late. And I'll never forget this quote from one of the SVPs who was leading the project at the time. We were talking about how to build community. And there were some strong advocates for a very open and flat and more meritocracy-based kind of approach. And the SVP at the time said on it, it still rings in my ears, he said, open Solaris exists only for Sun's interests. And that was kind of this poisonous moment for me. And I, I, still, I still can't forget it. And it didn't end up well. And so, you know, at the end of the day, Oracle acquired it, and it wasn't but months before it was completely shut down, the idea of a single vendor controlling it. And this is where I came from. This is the first project I worked on. So I ended up moving to a company called Pivotal. That's where I'm at today. And Pivotal is the opposite in some ways because it has the inverse ambition. It's starting out with a huge collection of open source projects. And it's investing lots and lots of money sponsored by EMC into how can we build an open platform company around these open source projects. A lot of these projects are actually either licensed or part of the Apache Foundation. So it's very special to be here today and participate with this community and, and be close to this, uh, the whole event. Uh, from Hadoop, where of course Roman is here, is Roman in the room? And I, I believe he mentioned that there are over six talks today by pivotal people uh, on Hadoop and various other projects. So Roman really leading our participation in Apache, uh, the Apache uh, world. I'm just a kind of an onlooker to some extent. So really to go to Roman for the, the latest and greatest there. But big investments to Hadoop. I, closer to home for me is Apache Tomcat. And I'm going to talk a little bit later in this about how this cloud architectural shift is a really huge opportunity for the lightweight approach of Apache Tomcat in the enterprise. Um, this shift to a scale-out architecture is, is a huge opportunity to make that the enterprise standard. And then, of course, Cloud Foundry carries an Apache 2 license, in addition to many other projects that we have, so close to home. You know, when open source started out, and this is kind of where Open Solaris came from, it was sort of like just open sourcing the code was a big thing. Like, we kind of thought that the magic would come from there. And, of course, we were wrong. 
And today, this is just very, very table stakes because it's also a lot about the collaborative community you build around it, around the community of users you have around it, and also aligning various people of commercial interest in the code. But the one thing that we do standardize on our Cloud Foundry project today, and I'll just share a little bit about you know, the project I work on and the lessons learned there, is the Apache, you know, Apache 2 license. And this is also important to our CLA. I can't tell you how many lawyers from various companies that want to participate with us will try to send me back a red line. And I know this sounds like a trivial thing that we use the Apache license, who cares? But I've been on so many calls with so many vendors that want to work with us, with so many people who want to contribute. And as soon as you give a lawyer a document, the first thing they do is mark it up. It's like their job. And they send it back to you to negotiate. And we have said, even to our parent company, VMware, I had a call with them where I said, nope, you cannot modify our CLA. You don't get to change anything. It's the only way we can move forward together. So this is a really important asset that, that the community has. And thanks to Apache for that. It's at the bedrock of how we invite people to our community. The other thing I've seen uh, that I think is really important is the second C, code, and then community, is that you have to have a strong base of users who are actually pushing back, and even the committers and even the people running the project. I've seen uh, with various infrastructures of service projects where there's been some critique where there's not enough user presence and user feedback. And this is something where Adrian from Spring has taught me a lot because they've made some mistakes with Spring Framework along the way. But because they had three million Java developers that were using this every day, the feedback loop was violent and immediate. And so <laughs> in some sense, I like to say that a large, robust, active community is the greatest governance model in some sense for anyone who's writing software. You know, be it commercial, proprietary, whatever have you. That feedback loop of this isn't working for me is really vital. And one of the curiosities that I have that I'll share with the team, with the group here today, is, is that in this world of cloud consumption, there's a new way that developers start experiencing things, and they experience them as web services. And one of the existential concerns I have for you know, software in general, and sometimes I feel uh, somewhat nostalgic being a defender of software, because in this world, there's this huge push to just consume a service, just grab a service and go. And I actually think software is fundamentally important. If you go back you know, to the beginning of when you broke away from the mainframe to the original Unix programmers, that idea of a portable thing you could use on any hardware was just so important, and has really given birth to the whole industry where I've made a living my entire life. Uh, but at the same time, we've got, you know, strong push for the average, you know, Hacker News developer to go try something as a service. So we did an experiment with Cloud Foundry where we launched day one a host and service that people could just come in and use for free. And I wonder if in the future of open software, if there won't be a foundation or maybe Apache will do this where, hey, some of the software is hosted on demand for people to consume in a scalable way and a not-for-profit way. That might sound too altruistic, but it's something that I've bandied about with IBM and others, like, hey, could we create a hosted sandbox for all of this software? Collaboration is, of course, fundamentally important to the success of any project. And this is where I think uh, somewhat the Open Solaris project wasn't quite uh, up to snuff, given the, the pure body weight ratio between almost 1,000 engineers working on the project that day was open sourced and anyone who wanted to come in. And this is where Apache has really created something very special. And uh, thinking back, the day I started at level three was June of 1999. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe that's the same date that Apache Foundation was founded. And so I've sort of grown up in an era where this whole idea of an open playing field for collaboration became the, the normative behavior in the industry. One thing we've been experimenting with is the idea that to make it even easier for a new developer to come and work on a project, we could invite them into our office. Has anyone ever done this where you've invited someone literally who's new to the open source community to your office to pair a program with you? Is this, is this something people are trying? We've seen it be very successful because at, at Pivotal, we come from Pivotal Labs, which has a pair programming, extreme programming background in agile software development. And <clears throat> by inviting people to work with us directly in a pair programming model, we can speed up their ramp rate. So IBM has sent about eight or 10 very talented people through the program. Um, other people are coming from SAP, Swisscom, et cetera. And we're even experimenting with customers about, hey, you want to get on our roadmap, you want to work with us, come pair program with us. 
And it's pretty cool because within about four to six weeks, they can get an expert level knowledge of a specific part of the code because every day they're working for you know, two four hour blocks with one of the core programmers on the project. So if anyone wants to come and participate in the open source JoJo, I'd welcome that. And just in general, I'm curious about this model and how it can work for open source communities. So commerce is the one thing that definitely has become a big, big part of the open source conversation. In 1999, it was seen as, and I'll get into this a little bit later, somewhat of a you know, cheaper than hackers delight kind of part of the uh, community. But today, it is fundamentally how most vendors do business. So I don't think it would have been possible to go build a net new infrastructure software company today that caters to developers without having the leading or a leading open source community around it. And we've also seen a, a huge influx of just investment into the open source world that has, I think, changed the game. Uh, with IBM, you know, they've been making some big bets for a long time. They made the famous billion dollar bet on Linux. And I was, again, it was sort of an interesting you know, decade ago to look at this and say, hey, they're gonna bet a billion dollars on this open source project named Cloud Foundry. I fundamentally believe they would not have made that bet if it were not for it being an Apache 2 license project. Like, with, without that foundation being there, I don't think there's any way that they could have mustered the financial resources that they're putting into it today. So things have definitely changed. Uh, it used to be open source versus proprietary for cost savings. But now we've moved into a world where any new standard is fundamentally defined by the leading open source project that implements it. Uh, it's a strategic access. And finally, I think it's winning because it pulls people into its community that are driven by a larger purpose motive as a differentiator. So it started with no one wants to be locked in. And I still deal with a lot of customers today that are dealing with IBM WebSphere and with Oracle WebLogic. And they feel the pain. And I, I just want to share with you the look on their faces as I sit across the table from you because it's so palatable. And I talked to this large media company that looked at me and said, just for our division, I owe $55 million in maintenance this year to Oracle for WebLogic. And he's just looking at me like, can you help? <laughs> Please. And I think this is why the world changed because there's such a bad taste in everybody's mouth about the old style of relationship, which was we'll sell you proprietary code that only we own and dictate the terms for the rest of your life as long as you want to use it of how much it costs every year. And of course, that's a, that's a great place to start from. And I think that really catapulted the whole conversation. But the thing that's also happened is that slingshot of momentum behind open source has given birth to the idea that open source is also the new open standard. And what we didn't do when we wanted to build an open platform as a service is say, okay, let's invite everyone into a room to talk about the standard which we would spec out together together for the next five years. Amazon certainly didn't ask for permission to go build the leading cloud. They just implemented it and they went. And I think the open standards conversation is by and large turned into the open, open source conversation. And implemented running code is, is the leadership position to be in. And that's a fundamental change again from a decade ago, thanks to the work of the folks at Apache. And this has finally made strategic, open source strategic to almost every company that's out there in terms of how you consume it. I had the pleasure of meeting with one of the largest banks in the world and they were talking about their next generation platform choices. And it was amazing to me how much they'd stalked and paid attention to the community aspects of Cloud Foundry. They came and said, hey, we were on the last advisory board call. We heard what you were saying there. We liked the contributions coming in from this boutique consultancy. And they were really looking when they made a decision at that open source community behind the product more than anything else. And that's what's made open source the game in town for almost anyone who's starting a company today. So there was a Black Duck survey. I inserted these, this in this morning. So Matt Acey, has anyone ever heard of him? He's from uh, TenGen, and he does a lot of writing on Read Write Web about open source and open source businesses. And this actually drove home some of the observations I've had just from being in the field every day and dealing with it, which is that in 2007, 80% of folks ranked, um, sorry, in 2007, 80% ranked cost as their primary driver for adopting open source. That's where that lock-in message came from. Nobody wanted lock-in. They wanted to save money. But today, 80% of people rank quality as the reason they're choosing open source. 
And this is really important to me because it gets to that idea that the best minds are participating in the open source projects. Well, some people that might have a, will we say sort of, I work for somebody and I do it because I have to mentality might be at the proprietary companies. And I think that's become palatable in the economy. The people know that the best minds are working in open source and they turn to open source for the best code quality. That's really important. The other thing is they said that access to source code has gone up in importance from 57% in 2007 to 80% today. And this gets back to that bank that you know, wanted to work on a next generation platform with us. They really wanted to have their developers be able to be hands on, to be part of that collaboration in order to make that bet. And that's again, fundamentally transformative from where we came today. The final point is that they wanna be able to attract and retain talent. And I hear this time and time again, which is that I can't retain talent if I don't have the leading open source technologies within my enterprise. I just can't do it. People aren't gonna come work for me on you know, Joe's Garage platform. They wanna be on the leading open source platform. They wanna be contributing. They wanna be a vibrant part of that conversation. So this is Matt's quote about it. And that what's changed is that people actually wanna get involved today. They wanna to see the code. They wanna understand it on a quality level and they wanna contribute back. And I think that's gonna be an interesting challenge. We're gonna to try to use this dojo approach to invite even some of these corporations to contribute. But I have a strong, there's a problem still out there with a lot of enterprise lawyers that even the people that are most committed to this sometimes still have to commit through shell companies. So they'll pay others to kind of funnel their code into the project. And you know, whatever we can do as a community to start educating enterprises now, I think vendors have all been educated, but if there's anything we can do around enterprise outreach, I think that's really important because there's a lot of talented people sitting in the enterprise unable to contribute because their concerns over IP um, from their legal teams. So this is the one I've been hinting at a bit, which is that I do think purpose motive is fundamentally why things like foundations, things like open source, went out in the end and had such a radical transformation over the last 10 years. I know for me personally, there's any number of things I could be doing working in the Bay Area. There's lots of job opportunities there today. But I've kind of tenaciously latched on to the current project I've worked on, and anyone who sees me on Twitter will know that I'm almost obsessed with it. And the reason I'm obsessed with it is that I believe that software should still exist in the cloud era. At the end of the day, I, I believe that. Like, I really think that we shouldn't give up on software, that we, shouldn't, we should still have our own inf access to our own infrastructure software if we want it. We shouldn't just be consuming cloud services everywhere we go. And I think this is the, the fundamental reason why open source has had such a big impact. So once you have you know, all of this going, there's different models for collaborating um, with strategic open source. We started on GitHub. And I think that sent a good signal immediately, like, hey, we're ready for pull requests, come on in, very lightweight. I know a lot of projects start there, lead into Apache incubation, et cetera. We made the decision um, for some unique reasons and because just the size and scope of our project to form a foundation of our own called the Cloud Foundry Foundation. Um, this is not something that we did lightly and we considered all the options, but at the end of the day, we had a lot of vendor stakeholders who really wanted to have uh, an input and wanted to be able to you know, contribute their own money to it, fund conferences, and really come to the table. Also, this, this happens sometimes where vendor companies will drive the decisions kind of tops down. So there's one particular company that did not choose kind of from grassroots developer up to join, they joined from the president of the company down and they wanted to join that way. So it's very interesting to me seeing these different models that have emerged for collaboration. We've partnered with these companies so far, so far. We have a platinum level, which is they contribute $500,000 a year to the Cloud Foundry Foundation. There's eight people who have signed up at the platinum level. We've also formed a gold level, and we're forming a silver level. There's some pretty big names here, and what most excites me about this is by, by joining, they really are giving the okay to their product departments to say, go invest in this, make a big bet on it. And I think that's really important because it, it signals the start of a race at these companies. So now Verizon has said, this is the paths of choice for us. SAP had their own background building their own proprietary paths, but now it's kind of come top down like, hey, let's move forward and collaborate, send people to Dojo, let's join this open source project. So I think it's, it's a fundamentally important and, and uh, a landmark moment for, for platforms of service. So I mentioned this before, my purpose motives for Cloud Foundry, and I'll finish the talk talking a little bit about how our architecture enables this. It's not so much a product pitch as it, the idea of the, what's possible with open source software on top of the infrastructure as a service. Because I believe at the end of the day that the infrastructure as a service should be a server to us. It really shouldn't be this full stack of things that does everything for us and we deposit a tiny bit of configuration on top. There's also a great quote from Dr. Nick, who's one of these just purpose motive guys. He has this 
great staying. He says, he's like, we're all here to serve. He says, we're here to provide service to everybody else. That's why we're alive. And Dr. Nick's really inspirational. He's the number one contributor in our open source, uh, our mailing list. And he has this great talk where he goes, everybody deserves nice things. And he's got this really funny Australian accent. He's like, everybody deserves nice things. And uh, it's, it's great when you hear it. But what he means is, the, there's a lot of great new startups out there using cloud services and using the latest and greatest, but we need to bring this stack to the enterprise to everybody as well, and that everybody should have cloud services and be able to participate with them. So I don't know, did anyone see this Google Cloud announcement? Did you see this come out? I thought it was pretty interesting. They really, really reduced the concentration gradient, now getting a little bit into PaaS and talking about PaaS a bit. They reduced the concentration gradient between a raw IaaS and a, their app engine, which was one of the first passes that ever, ever launched. And it used to be that you could either go app engine or you go IaaS. And what they did is they used the idea of a declarative deployments where they did health checking on those declarative deployments. We also have the same approach. So there's really two layers that we have. Let me click through again. Where you can have a fully managed runtime. In the future, you'll be able to just push a Docker file. We've got some contributions out there that enable that. Or you also can deploy wholesale clusters in a very declarative way. And I'm going to give you a quick demo of that in a second. And this really changes the debate about what's an IaaS, what's a PaaS, because you can step up along the way. If you just want a managed OS and logging for that and health management for that, you can do that for, say, a database or a, a more stateful thing. Or if you want a fully managed runtime that's more stateless, you can graduate to a full-fledged PaaS. So this is the, the lightweight architectural diagram of what Cloud Foundry is today. Uh, we support multiple infrastructures of service. So CloudStack support was donated by NTT and a university from China. Again, you, there's no predicting where these things will come from, and it was great to see that coming organically from the community. I would say there's been a great resurgence in CloudStack actually over the last six months. Sky over in Britain is uh, working on CloudStack with uh, Cloud Foundry on top of it. And you know, it's, it's great to see this coming up. NTT is also, also doing that. But at the end of the day, this is similar to that Google architecture, and except that we are IaaS independent. So you can deploy these clusters in a very declarative way, and I'll show you a demo of that. Or you can consume an elastic runtime service, which is a managed runtime that's highly scalable. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the future. And my call to action here is that this can be a common framework for deploying other data services and other cloud services um, across the open source community. So this is a little bit unfair because Amazon Beanstalk is not like the most robust platform as a service enabling technology in the world. But I wanted to point out that there's no reason that just raw software can't compete with these cloud services offered by these infrastructure service vendors. So you just did a quick bake off you know, we can use lightweight containers. You know, I heard Stratus. This is very popular to use containers today. I think that's where everything is headed. Um, instead, Amazon Beanstalk, it's, its legacy, it came out, you know, five or six years ago, uses a heavy VM overhead. So that means that if you want to deposit a 500 megabyte application, you might have to put it into a 1.7 gigabyte container. And you can all just see where the waste comes from there as you scale out. The second thing is you have to wait for a VM to be created versus a container. Container be created in you know, half a second. And a VM, of course, has all number of things to start up and get going with. We are very into 12-factor app um, compliance. Have folks heard of 12-factor applications? Do people think about this in their architectures? So not too many. Uh, it's the idea that your app configuration or your configuration for running your application should be external to the application. So the platform should deposit the configuration code in, usually in an environment variable on the file system, whereas Beanstalk uses some in-app configuration files. Built-in logging is very important. The whole idea of this platform as a service and even the, the Google Cloud where they talked about the managed VM, the idea that as soon as you deploy something, you should get streaming logs just for that set of applications or that user immediately from all aspects of the platform is an important thing that, that we do that does not come from Amazon Beanstalk today. The final thing I'll mention is that when you go to do blue-green deployments, so you go to do code updates and switch things over, they suggest that you do DNS changes, which of course have propagation latency, and we do instantaneous cutover on our own internal load balancer. Finally, they're Amazon only. This is you know, maybe the most interesting part of the commercial conversations I'm having, and I think this is truly a, a profound moment in the history of enterprise middleware. It used to be that you wanted a vertically scaled, clustered approach to doing um, middleware or runtime containers. 
What's happened is that the cloud has changed that. Folks like Netflix have used Apache Tomcat for scale out architectures, where in order to get resiliency, you scale out. In order to get scalability, you also scale out. And all of the factors I've talked about before that have made open source front of mind for enterprises today have led to the idea that when we talk to folks, they view Cloud Foundry as like the leading solution. They don't view us as the inexpensive thing to Oracle. They don't even want to have that conversation as much as they hate it. They really see us as the vanguard of the next generation architectures. And it's my posit that this next 10 years will be dominated in the enterprise by open source middleware in a way that the last 10 that they were locked into the old architecture won't be. And I think that's huge. Uh, because it always was, we were sort of competing with Tomcat by itself as a cheaper container, and now we've implemented an architecture where we can really be aggressive about, this is your cloud platform, and folks are really paying attention to it more than before. I, I can't tell you enough that everybody wants it. So when I talk to them, it's just a matter of how do they migrate to it. Like, I've not had a meeting with folks that are running enterprise middleware today that said, hey, this sounds like a horrible thing to have a platform that automatically scale, deploy, and manage everything I'm doing. Like, no one comes away from that meeting. The question is, like, how do they unbind themselves from the decisions they've made before? And that's the challenge we have. But I think the future is very, very bright. So I'm going to show you then, that's the elastic runtime management part of our platform. But we also have this declarative cluster deployment that I'm pretty excited about as well. And in this case, we've taken something like Apache Hadoop, and we're building a cluster on Google Compute Engine in about three minutes. And what you'll see here when it starts up, this is the tool Cloud Foundry Bosch. And you'll see that its CPI, this is the cloud provider interface, is set for Google Compute Engine. And you're now going to do a Bosch deploy. This is this declarative cluster deployment. Now there's a manifest that describes every bit, every bit of state that the, pro that the platform wants to see now come into life on Google. The first minute and 25 of this is we're automating the creation of all of the VMs necessary on GCE. You could probably cut about 40 seconds out of this, except right now Google is throttling its API. So it'll let us create a bunch of VMs quickly and then it slows us down for a bit. Uh, at the end of the day, we could probably do this in about 32 seconds, which is about how long it takes to start VMs on Google. It's about two and a half times faster than Amazon if you guys have, have never used it. So the, the VMs that are necessary for the cluster will start up completely automated in about a minute 25. And the next thing you'll see is that it'll start those VMs and it'll deposit an agent on them. And that agent sits on a standardized operating system, so everything about the platform is really appliance-like. That standardized operating system then will pull down all of the packages necessary and layer every process it needs to start the cluster. The thing I'll mention here is, is that this is, again, where open source is very important to us because our cluster deployment tools, we really like to build from source ourselves every time. We don't like to take a lot of pre-compiled things. We don't like things that are already laid out in a specific way in a file system. We like access to source code. And it might not be possible to do this engine in a different world where we really were dealing with things like SAP and Oracle, et cetera. So now what's happening is it's binding the agent to those VMs, and they're all joining at the role that they're specified. And you'll see various services here like Ganglia and other Hadoop, Hadoop stack services being started up. So at the end of the day, it takes about three minutes. Now it's all starting up. You can see the slaves, HDFS, name node, um, Ganglia. We put a little monitoring into this. At the end of the day, you get a, a Hadoop cluster of about 10 nodes. And we can do it up to 200 in three minutes. And the thing that was exciting about this for me and my purpose motive is that Google wrote us. And they said, how'd you do that? Um, their previous demo on uh, GCE was 10 minutes using their own tooling. And it was pretty cool to have like, one of the most powerful, unbelievably talented you know, companies in the world that has so much engineering power come to us and say, hey, hey how'd you do that on a cloud? And they want to advertise us a bit. So we'll poke around here, and you'll see that we're not faking it. Um, it we'll, we'll touch a couple different parts of the cluster here. This is Ganglia, and then they'll log into the name node, et cetera. The thing is, is that we also then showed this to the Apache Cassandra folks, and they said, how'd you do that? That's really fast. You know, we, we don't do you know, 800 node clusters that quickly on GC or any IaaS. And so we're working with them to build Cassandra as a service using the same technology. And my call to action is anyone who wants to work together with us on building a rapidly deployed, rapidly updated, health monitored, you know, scalable cloud service together with this tech, be welcome to have that conversation and see how we could work together. So next slide, if I, that'll let me get out of the video. Again, maybe unfair, but uh, just to bake us off against the, the cutting edge in, the, in, in uh, you know, Amazon, which is sort of one of the early cloud leaders, a good benchmark to have. It takes them about seven minutes to start an EMR cluster. 
Um, we're about two and a half times faster. The other thing we can do is we can then double the size of it. So it keeps track of you know, how big the cluster is, what expected state, where you wanna go. And you can double the size then in about the same time. I think there's lots of things we can do here. And I think we can start to bring the time down to under two minutes as VM creation time gets even faster. And you start to give developers access to have whatever configuration they want on tens of thousands of machines almost instantaneously. I think that's a transformative moment in developer productivity in the cloud era. So I'll finish up here pretty quickly. Uh, when we bring this together, we talk about our value prop. And again, this isn't really a Cloud Foundry pitch, uh, more of just an overview of what we're working on and how we're thinking about it. But the idea that you can push an application in a very simple way to a platform as a service, you can then get all these built-in operational features so that you don't have to worry about your running code. The logging's there, the ID, the permission to access control, it's all there for you. And then get a very large ecosystem of attached data services to it that don't just run in single containers or single nodes, but can really be very large, very robust clusters. So this time around, just to wrap up, I think maybe there's some better signs of life in the project I'm working on today, at least I hope so. And you know, we started from the start, we started very early open sourcing it. As soon as we had working code, it was out on GitHub. And we also started with this hosted version of it so people could experience it very rapidly to try to build a community. Um, the difference this time is that Paul Moritz, who's our CEO, pardon me, ex-CEO of VMware, when he talked about you know, self-interest and what the idea behind this was, he's actually quoted and wired and saying, hey, this is a leap of faith for us. We're gonna build the largest possible community around this and hopefully a business after that. So that's very different from that old quote where I said, hey, this only exists for our self-interest. I feel much better about that. Finally, in collaboration, uh, working with you know, Apache Group, Apache Foundation, um, the various projects within it, with our GitHub approach, Dojo, community pairs, we are all out focused on collaboration. That's why we're here today. So I think things are looking much brighter. And this really fits into the overall arc what we've seen of change in the open source economy, where we've gone from cost savings based, uh, cheaper approaches, where the enterprise has really woken up to the idea that purpose motive is important to software, and that the place to get the best software are the collab highly collaborative organizations that are promoting that today. So that's my quick chat, it was, thanks for having me. <laughs>